you look amazing, uh, even though you may not believe me. I don't, but it's fine. As most women don't. So, but I say it to just say it. So it said that I said it. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so, but welcome to the show. This is the Will Farrow Show. Dariani is in the building. Thank you for being here. Appreciate I'm here. You, you are here. You are I here. am. During this quarantine, you, you look amazing. You look like you look kept. You don't have a unibrow like my homegirl. Well, I'm gonna keep it funky. I'm just very low maintenance. So, you know, I think some people were stressing like, oh my God, how am I gonna do? I don't really do that many things. So, plus I do my own nails, so. Wow, that, I, I didn't, didn't realize how big of a commodity that was until we went into this. I was like, yo, nail shops are essential. Yeah. I know nail yeah, shop. No, there are women who have literally put their lives at risk just to get their nails done during this quarantine. I seen one creative chick, she um, she went to a lady's house and told the lady to stick her hand out of the mailbox. And I saw that. On her porch, just getting it in. I was like. Listen, I'm not knocking anybody's hustle. I'm not either, do what you do. But I'm staying in my house, I'm not. Uh, yeah, no, 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 I got my, my little kit that I always have and I just, I just do my own. It's actually very therapeutic. Is it? Yeah, because okay, the process of taking your nail polish off, right? And then filing your nails and then like slow, you know, you have to be, it's really meticulous. You have to slowly paint your nails like and do like, that is a very meticulous process. So it's very therapeutic. It's almost like I'm in a meditative state when I do it, believe it or not. It's actually an art to it too. I've noticed that like when I've seen some of my, my friends do it, it's kind of like, for those that don't really be looking at it, it's like you gotta really be detailed with the way you kind of like stroke towards like the end of it. Yeah, your stuff. So that's what I'm saying. And I don't even, even in a quarantine setting, like I'm not a person that slows down a lot. So like me doing my own nails is like that moment, that opportunity for me to do that. I feel you on that slow down mode because I was uh, getting ready today and I was like, okay, I got to hurry up and get this stuff done because I got to make sure I get here on time. And I was like, where the fuck is here? You have nowhere to go. Uh, that's like when I'm driving during this quarantine and the person behind me is beeping. I'm like, where are you going? What is the yeah. urgency for you to wait in line in front of a Ralph's? That's what it is. That, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But that, that that's what that's this quarantine is about. So... Um, but are you are you going out Friday? We opening up Friday? Are you going out? I mean, you're saying am I going out? Where am I gonna go? Disney World? Like, <laughs> there's like a flower <laughs> shop. Not that many things are really opening up. It's not like it's not like California is officially open. Like, yeah, I'll be at the club. Like, I don't know. Pe people are like ready to go. Like, my, like I've heard some people like, yo, I'm running to the beach as soon as it hits. So the beach is going to be open. That's what I, I thought. Been, the beach was going to be open to the 15th. I look. I don't know, nor do I care, because I'm not coming outside. I'm really? Saying, I'm no, treating, I, no, I am. I I'm I can't go. Mm -mm. For my mental health, I need to be around humans. It doesn't mean I need to, you know, be at a concert or like a huge gathering. But like, one of the hardest parts of this quarantine is how inhumane it is to not be around humans. Yeah. We are social creatures by nature, and I am very much, as you know, a social creature. So even like going to the supermarket and everybody has the, you know, the masks on and I'm, I'm meticulously going out of, I'm like going out of my way to not be around people. That is so inhumane and it yeah. fucks with you. It does, it does a little bit, uh, but that's all the reason why I'm still waiting because I don't want to, get that urge, be around people, and then something happens. And then another thing I uh, kind of realized in being in this quarantine, I don't go a lot of places. I realized, so I was like, yo, like once this opens, if I can get back to my normal routine, that'll be fine. Cause outside of my office, the filming studio here, and then like going to like, maybe like Patrick Cloud, Cleo's house or something like that. I don't go too many places. Yeah, see, but you just said one thing, filming. I cannot wait to get back to work. You know, my show was greenlit. So literally, if this quarantine wasn't happening, I'd be shooting a godforsaken show. So uh, can I ask you about that? So you- Ask me all the questions. You and another person I know, both were like greenlit shows. Like 
one of my friends literally like right now he should be in Atlanta filming the second season of their show. Mm-hmm. And right now y'all are in the house yeah. knowing that not only do you have this job kind of waiting for you, but now you yep. have to wait. Like what does that do for like your mental capacity? Well, first of all, it's a couple, you know, it, it, it's a whole bunch of things. First of all, um, I'm so grateful that I know that once it's over, I have a job because so many freelancers don't have that security. So many humans don't have that security right now. So the fact that I have my dream job after this, I'm, I'm profoundly grateful. But I'm also like, really? Because like, I finally, you know, I've been in LA for two years. I, I get my own TV show on a network and it's like, yeah, but unfortunately you're gonna have to wait because the world is ending and now there are more murder hornets. You know what I'm saying? Murder um, hornets. Yeah, so like, it's like literally the biggest, genuinely the biggest news of my career. I got told this the week that the quarantine started, they called me Wow. and so that's the thing is like production would have been started. They want production to start, uh, yeah. but yeah. So it's very, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's a mind fuck, bro. It's definitely a mind fuck. That gotta be just like to be that close to everything that's, you've achieved. And it's just like, but you gotta wait, you gotta wait. That's literally what it is. It's like the universe being like, okay, perfect. Got the perfect guy for you. Six, three, smart as hell, all this, but. He actually is living in a box for the next year and we can't find him. But after that year, he's yours. He's oh, perfect. Yeah. Right. We have your career ready. It's going to be nice. It's going to be great. Uh, but it's going to have to be on railway for the next few months. And uh, you just have to wait. Payment is in time for you to wait. And it's just like. Yeah. And now I'm on unemployment. Like, who am I? Right. And you got, but but like you said, you're blessed enough to have oh. a job waiting and to say like even being in LA for two years and now being able to have your own show is such a blessing and is such an accomplishment, which actually leads us into the topic of today's show. Ooh. So um, tomorrow will mark officially three years since I've moved to Los Angeles. Yay! And- Appreciate that. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on this show was because I know you've been here for two years. Um, I know a bit about your story, but I know a lot of people may not know, but um, you're out here by yourself. Like you were just like, you know, I'm going to chase my dreams, F it, I'm coming out here. I was the same way. So I felt like, you know, the milestone they say in Los Angeles, if you've been in Los Angeles for five years, you're now officially a resident. We're not there yet, but I feel like as long as we've been here, we've accomplished a lot. You know, I've kept track of your like career and everything you've been doing and progressing from now. And then just, of course, like you said, the pinnacle of having your own show. And, you know, we know people that have taken a long time being here before they even get some of the things that we've been doing. So I really just wanted uh, to have you on here to kind of talk about our journey of being here for, you know, just kind of starting now and where we are now as far as this journey has taken this. I mean, yeah, like I said before, I'm just grateful because some people take a long time and, and some and some people just don't. Some people don't make it six months, don't make it a year, don't make it two years, and they, and they go back home because they give up or it's, it's just too much. So the fact that, listen, I don't take any little baby blessing for granted. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been a job. See, it's crazy. I came out here with not, not, I mean, not like too many solidified goals. Like I didn't really know the exact kind of show I wanted. So it kind of just fell in my lap as crazy as it sounds. Do you know how I booked my show, Struggle Gourmet? No, 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 like please, like run, run this down. Let them know what Struggle Gourmet is too. For yeah, those yeah. And everything. So Struggle Gourmet is my show on Fuse. I shot a three episode pilot, uh, two months ago now and then depending on how well it did on digital on their YouTube they were gonna pick it up it got picked up but I like to tell this story because it's such a testament to how I've worked this whole time because like people always ask me how do you become a TV host but there is absolutely no oh you have to do this 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 that and you're good no it's not like becoming a lawyer or a librarian it doesn't work like that so the way that I got that show was the director that was the dude that was gonna direct it posted on his Instagram looking for a person who knows how to host and can cook, right? Right. I didn't follow him. I don't know this man. 
but two different people whom I knew um, typed in my name for him on his story and then he reached out to me and bada bing bada boom, I shot the pilot, they greenlit it and all is good. But the reason I say that, and it's crazy because I have a dope agent, I have an amazing agency. They're not the ones that got me that job. Right. What got me that job was two things. One, me branding. I branded myself as a TV host who cooks. You saw, if you saw that, if you would have seen it, Will, you would have been like, you would have typed my name because you would have been like, I know exactly who that is. Yeah. And then two, being a delightful person to be around because both of the humans that suggested me, one I had worked with before and the other I only met once for like seven minutes. But had I been a giant dick to them, they probably wouldn't have written my name. So those two things are very important. Branding yourself and not being a cunt. See, hey, you two very important things that I feel take years for people to learn that you mastered, in my opinion, already. Thank you. In Thank the you. that you've been here. So uh, I want to take this back. So it's been two years, so that would be what, 2018 you moved out here? Yes, sir. So if you can, if you if you can rewind back, tell me what was can you remember the pinnacle moment for you when you were like, yo, I'm finna do this? Like when was that? Where were you at in your life? And it was like, yo, these this is the motion of where this is finna start where I'm finna move to Los Angeles. Yeah, so I was initially gonna move summer of 2018, but then so random, I booked a random job, it took me to Cuba, and I was like, no, it's not my time during the time that I was supposed to leave, I was like, no, it's my time to go to Cuba. I still have work to do, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I ended up moving my grandma, my uncle from Miami to Jersey to live with us. Yeah. Um, and then I just, I kind of just felt like I'm like, I, I, you know, I opened my restaurant. I, I feel like I've tried to like fix everything in my family, you know, like, and I was just like, no, like it's a wrap. Like I was, I was technically still 27. And I was like, nah, like I'm starting 2018 and I'm just moving to LA. I was like, if I don't do it now, I'm, ne I'm never gonna do it. And I've always, I've always had a fear of living a life of regret. That's always been a big fear of mine. Yeah. And that was it, homie. That was it. And you just, so what, but what, what gave you that urge? Cause I know a lot of people, what you had just mentioned about, it was either, if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna do it. Well, I had gotten, I realized that I had gotten comfortable. And I was, I was like, ill. Like, no, dead ass. Like, that's really what it was, is that I realized I was comfortable and I was around, remember, I was still, so I'm Cuban, which means we live at home until we get married. And then sometimes we go, we go back, it's a whole thing. But anyway, so I'm surrounded by my whole family. And now I have my grandma, my uncle, and I'm just surrounded by all this family. And I'm like, yo, I, I can't do this. I'm like, I need to, I need to be alone. I need to really, I need to struggle. I need to really just take that risk. So I think that's really what it was. It was me just being around all of my family and realizing like, I'm not the superwoman who's gonna fix this relationship and that relationship and all of these things. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna be selfish. And that is something that is kind of novel for me because like, I've always been like my family's rock and that's beautiful and that's great and that's wonderful, but like, nah, you're supposed to be selfish in your 20s. Yeah, but you did it to where it paid off. You know, it was a time to be selfish that took you somewhere and somewhere that you wanted to be. And now look at it, it's thriving. So I don't even really feel like it's more of a selfish thing. It's more of just you evolving, which Correct. is what is necessary for all of us. Yeah, and like also another reason that I lived at home besides the fact that I'm Cuban and that's like what we do is I saved a lot of money at home and that was not a mistake. That was very tactful because I don't come from money. So I knew that if I go to LA and I'm like, oh, well, I'm broke. Mom and dad bailed me out. They'd be like, we don't know what to tell you. Right. So, and the reason I say that is because if anyone has these kind of aspirations, you need to have some financial literacy because like there are, obviously there have been times in the span of two years where I don't work for a full month. And, but I'm chilling because I have savings. Had I not, then I'm stressed. And when you have that stress, at least for me, I'm, I do not thrive on stress. I don't do well. That's, I, I, I don't eat and I get skinny. I don't like that either. Yeah. Um, some people might thrive off stress and that's wonderful. I know, who I, I know how I am. 
So that was like a really big thing for me. I was like, I'm gonna come out here so that I'm good. So if hypothetically I don't work for a full year, I'm still chilling. Yeah, yeah. I always tell people you gotta have what I call the 5,000 mark. Um, in my opinion, I've always said this. Well, it's not even an opinion, it's a fact because I've proven it. $5,000, you can go live wherever you want. If you have five grand, you can move anywhere in the world and will be okay. But if you don't, you are pretty much screwed. And so, and I'm gonna keep it fun with you. I don't think five thousands, and I think five thousands reckless. Can you make it happen? But in LA, bro, five thousand. I'm I'm just keeping it funky. Five thousand will go real quick in a place like LA. No, no, and it, and they can. So that's the reason why if you can't make, and the reason why I leave it at five thousand because the fact that it can go that quickly. If you have a hard time struggling to get that and keep that. Yeah. That's when you really kind of look at yourself before you move here. Because I think what Fs a lot of people up in moving here is that they don't think of the small little amenities that you have to start paying for. Like me, I grew up in Texas, so we didn't worry about parking. Parking was everywhere. Now yeah. that I have to pay to park to go in my house, that's a whole different thing. And to know that that's racking up to 200 to 300 a month, those are the little things people will look over and forget. And those are one of the things, a lot of things I had to think about during my time when I got the ball rolling. My story is a little bit crazier than how yours is. It was like moving your grandma, moving your grandma and uncle from like Miami to your house. And again, like you said, Cuban. And if you kind of know who you are, that is just a house one built for a show, but also just like full of crazy. <laughs> Awesomeness at the same time. Uh, during my time, this was like, 2014 before I moved here. So I lived in Sacramento for three years before I moved to Los Angeles. But I'm gonna take you back to 2014 when I was living in Texas. I was working at the Apple store. And um, that's gonna be a whole nother subject, but <laughs> it is a story of being discriminated by the discriminator. So if you think it's hard for a person of like a LGBTQ status to work in the straight, a male driven business. Imagine being a straight black male in a dominated LGBTQ work flow. Interesting. Yeah, so it, it wasn't bad. I actually learned a lot from it, but it taught it really taught me a lot. But that's for a whole other subject. So um I got fired from Apple. Um some things that happened involving an iMac and a shady manager and a knife going through my foot not like metaphorically like physically i stepped on a foot and a knife and stabbed my foot so um the day that's that impressive I, yeah i was um i've been smoking the weeds as some of the folks say um and didn't realize there was a knife in my dirty clothes pile and yeah don't know how i got there don't know what i was doing but um stepped on it and went through my foot Oh. <laughs> yeah, went to the hospital, got stitches, and showed up to our weekly Sunday staff meeting on crutches, making sure I didn't miss it. Next day, they told me I was fired, and they walked my quick, weeble wobbled ass out of the Apple store while I was on crutches. So, could have been defeated, but I saw it as an opportunity that now the net is gone. You know, that safety net is gone. I don't know how I'm gonna make money and stuff like that. But then it just kind of came to a point where I was like, you know, this is a good place for you to start over. So at the time I was living with my cousin in a town home um, in like the uh, center of Houston. I was like, yo bro, I can't afford this. I know you want to move in with your gal. So have her just take my part of the lease and then I'm moving with my homeboy on the other side of town, which was, you know, a little bit more ghetto. So staying there with him, my aunt, gets transferred to Sacramento. And at this time, I'm just doing like freelance graphic design, you know, to eat, pay the rent, the course of the rent that I do gotta pay. And my aunt was like, yo, do you wanna come with me to Sacramento? Cause I don't wanna be there by myself. Now, mind you, I already know what I'm setting myself up for. So let me give you the backstory. One, my aunt's bipolar. Literally. Yeah, my aunt is, is Bipolar. And is she, but is she like medicated and pro proactive about her mental health? The, yeah. You know, the reason I ask this is because just because right. someone's bipolar doesn't mean they can't be an amazing functional person. Oh, no, she, she's amazingly functional. She's just an asshole. And okay. you have to, you have to kind of know when her assholeness, you have, you, she has an expiration date of how long you could be around her. 
and she understands that. She has a husband for the last 32 years I've never met. I don't know what this guy looks like. They are married, papers and all. He is a truck driver. Stops in in Houston every once in a while. They do their thing and then he leaves and continues truck driving. Again. It seems like they got a good deal going. They do. She and she <laughs> admits she was like, yo, he know what it is. He come here, I fuck, we eat, enjoy our time, talk shit, argue, cuss this nigga out, then he leave and go do his shit. I like I can't, I can't. Sounds like you're on to pioneer, but all Yeah, right. I was like, I can't really knock you for that. But I knew it was an opportunity to go where I wanted to go. So I was like, yeah, like I'm not doing nothing but sleeping on my friend's couch for 150 bucks a month. I'm like, yo, let's dip. Now mind you, this is the same aunt that when I was little told me I was not a part of their family because we don't have the same last name. In front of everyone. So I, again, I knew what I was going up against. So being out there now for someone like myself, I'm now in a situation of, I have an aunt who's a working class person. So in her mind is, in order to get ahead in life, work, take some of that money, buy jewelry, save that up like diamonds and gold, save that up somewhere so you got something to fall back on. Never been that person, never want to be the whole, I have a boss type thing, I was never that guy. I was like, so that's not gonna happen. So I was like, you know, maybe I can go back to school, maybe I can go do something. And I was like, still doing freelance graphics. Now to her, as any other person that's an aunt at that age, you just see me on the computer all day. So it looks like I'm just playing video games. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not doing shit. I'm just, I'm here. And so she's getting frustrated. She's not really communicating with me. We bump heads and basically she gives me this ultimatum that wind, that I wind up leaving. I have to leave the apartment we got. Gave her my rent money and the remainder of my car note money for rent. She still wanted to put me out. Uh, luckily, I was in school, so I got to stay with one of my classmates on their couch. Car got repossessed on Martin Luther King Day. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's probably my birthday, actually, because uh, me and Martin Luther King had the same birthday. No well, big deal. Both of y'all good, so I can see why y'all sharing the same birthday. As <laughs> so, um got repossessed, uh, all of that stuff could still just beat you down. But I was like, you know what? I'm still close to Los Angeles. Let me start this acting thing. Started trying to do some acting roles in Sacramento. I hated auditions. They're not fun. I, acting shit is not fun. No, I did two and then that's when I realized, I was like, well, I now realize I'm gonna make my own movies, cast people I want to cast and be the shit I want to be in because Hollywood does not have me in high favor at all. They was like, some dude literally flat out told me in my face, and I, I always appreciate this for him. I can't remember his last, his last name, but I know his name is Mark. So if you're saying this, thank you. He said, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. Hollywood will never cast a black dude that's six foot three with locks your size as the head of the show. You no. Will, you will Which always, annoys me. Right. They was like, you will never, they will never show you as the star of the show. They was like, cause they don't know how to show that. They was like, the only way you're gonna do it is if you go work with Tyler Perry or something. And I was like, very true. And so when I thought about that, that's why now you see how I move with the whole branding, um, setting up your own type of stuff to be able to get your own things going because now you can write them rather than them depicting who you are. Yeah. So three years have passed, staying in Sacramento, had the opportunity to work with All Deaf before I moved to Los Angeles. So I was doing skits with them um, and I would be driving back from Sacramento to Los Angeles each time. That is that is not an easy drive. No. At all. I do that like in one day too. So I drive six to seven hours, shoot a skit that's only like maybe five minutes long. Yeah, yeah, yeah get paid 75 bucks and then drive another six hours that same day and be back in class for 8 a.m. Um, and then two though, it, it taught me a little bit about what the scene was here before I moved. Cause I remember somebody telling me, they were like, you drove six hours just to be in this? And they was like, why? I was like, because I wanted more than you. That's why. And having that mindset coming out here, which was three years ago, has moved me very much up the scales that a lot of people that have been here. Cause I think, like you said, you had brought up about kind of getting comfortable like in New Jersey before you came out here. 
I think a lot of people tend to get comfortable here in Los Angeles because of how many opportunities are around. I hear that a lot too. I hear that a lot. Too. I mean, one of the things I heard when I first moved here was like, oh girl, you're gonna kill it. You're from the East Coast and you got that hustle. And I was like, facts. Yeah. Um, but I always found that really interesting how people always say like, we just get comfortable because it's nice out and all that. And I get it, it makes sense. But as previously stated, when you don't come from money, you can't, you quite literally can't afford to get comfortable, you right. know? Um, that and I don't just represent myself. I represent myself, my family, Latinas, right. you know, I, I represent so much more than just myself. And I don't take that for granted. You know, yeah. like I gotta make moves for a whole entity of humans, you know? Yeah. And I, so. and I, and I just gotta say though, um, and this is a section that I have on this show that uh, I'm starting to introduce now, which is called the roses section. I like to give people their roses while they're here. Um, most folks don't see this coming. So I'm about to compliment the shit out of you. Just. <laughs> I love you thrive on compliments. Yes. So. First of all, I have to say that, and it still goes with what's uh, going on now, that I have to really commend you to the highest power. And I don't think, and, and I'm not sure, and, I, and I'm sure you don't take this for granted, but I don't know if so many people bring it up, but I just have to. I have a tremendous respect for you and will always have a tremendous respect for you for the fact that you came out here by yourself from everything you know across this country to just be able to do one not only something you love but to bet it all on yourself and to not only do that to stay dedicated to continue to grow to continue to learn which is one of the biggest things i think a lot of folks tend to not do you can i always see you continue to learn with every conversation you have from an acting perspective from a growing perspective from a woman's perspective from a friend's perspective from a relationship perspective Every time I see you interact with somebody, I can see the process of you learning and taking in what they're saying. And then I see you push that out into everything that you do. And so I just want to really commend you and show you and let you know I have a deep respect for the hustle that you've given yourself in just two years, because I know in 10, you are going to be fucking dangerous. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, thank you, because I am so big on giving people their roses when they're alive. Like, if you ever get a birthday card from me, I go in. It's not just like a love you mean, nah, like I'm so big on that. It's so important because our words are so powerful and you have no idea whose day you can make just by giving them one compliment. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. I was gonna say something else don't remember damn it <laughs> well you mentioned how i bet on myself and that is i think that's just so 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 important because at the end of the day like no one can tell me anything yeah and i'm not even trying to pull a kanye but like you in order to make it in any capacity of your life you have to a be your number one fan but you have to just so fervently believe in what the fuck you're gonna do and that it's yours. Oh, yeah. That there's no exterior top. No, 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 that shit don't even matter. Oh, yeah. Damn it, I had something else to say. <laughs> really upset because I felt like it was good, but I was just really happy because you complimented me and I, and I do I do love a compliment. I know. Mm -hmm. okay. It's got, all right, it'll come back. It'll come back. You it'll got, you got, back. but you got to Kanye yourself sometimes because. I don't think enough people do because they don't do it for themselves. So they don't know how to give it back to people that really do deserve it. And so I think that is one of the biggest things. So I said, like, yo, like, you're, you're a comp, like, I've always said, um, and it's because of my upbringing, uh, I have a very bittersweet upbringing because I always have people back home to remind me of just how valuable what I'm doing here is. Like, I've seen people who are ju either just as talented as me in certain things or even more, or even more talented, but, due to decisions and things in life, they didn't go in the direction that I went in. And so they tell me all the time, like, yo, don't take this for granted. So like every time I have that thought about, man, I should just, I know I should just have a kid right now. I'm hitting in these thirties, I need to have a kid. I'll call my cousin and hear them babies in the back and he telling me something, I'm like, well, I'm glad I still made this decision to not be a father uh, yet. Well, that's the thing that, you know, we are privileged because so many people, 
for so many different reasons can't pursue their dreams or couldn't, or even if it's just them convincing themselves of that. So I don't take that for granted, but I did remember what I was gonna say. Um, you said before that you commend me for leaving Jersey and moving to LA. And, and that's, I mean, yeah, technically that is a big deal, but the reason I don't see it as that big of a deal because I think of the fact that my family migrated from Cuba to fucking America with zero money, with no knowledge of the language, with whole families. And they made that shit work. And there were no iPhones at the time. They couldn't fucking Google how to use a subway or anything. So I think, I, I you know, I, I think it would be audacious for me to not struggle and audacious for me to not take risks because the people I come from took risks that I could never even fathom. Oh yeah, yeah, that's very true. And But even, even when you sit down and you get to tell, you know, like the kids that you have, like these stories, like, both of these stories are very important to the next generation of us. For sure. So the people who do will have to, you know, migrate to this country just to make themselves better, which is still going on to this day and going to keep going on most likely. To the folks who are here that are just like, yo, if I can just make something of myself outside of the normal, folks like myself, folks like you, to be able to see those stories to go, yo, we didn't have anything. We didn't have these opportunities given to us we found them, created them, and was able to keep thriving on them. But it's not like it, it is a privilege to be able to continuously work hard on something that we believe in. Yeah, but never, is, yeah. But never is it for us that we take it for granted that we take it as oh, I could just you know like it's here, so I'm good. No, and I and I always feel like a lot of people that don't chase their dreams kind of feel that way, and it's like no, you work just I work if not harder than you, just as hard as you. We may not do the same thing, but believe me, I think I, I always mess up Andre's 3000s line on this song, but it's like, um, he goes, I live check to check, beat to beat. So if I can uh, rock, make you rock to this beat and move your feet, then my family can't afford to eat. I know I fucked that whole line up. So I'm, <laughs> I'm on the high royal. Yeah, from Andre 3000. Yeah. But the concept of that it was like, yo, it's so true. So it's like, you know, scratch all the Hollywood facade and stuff like that. There's a lot of work that goes into this, like a lot of people don't understand. Cause you know, apparently I hate to give these people this shine, but apparently I am a, uh, I give off the perception I am a trust fund baby and uh, industry baby, apparently. Yep, a trust fund baby. Yeah, I, apparently I did not struggle. I come from Hollywood. You really, wait, you did ask people like say that about you? Yeah, somebody like so we we've had this uh this is fascinating. Yeah, we had this ongoing issue with this uh show that's disputing our show. And so they um had a platform that they were given uh to stake their case. And the guy that has the show said that myself and Patrick and Cleo, we are all children of the industry. We're privileged, which is why we can steal ideas because we have the money to be able to do that, put a machine behind it and not have to worry about anything. I was like but, but they don't hear your accent? <laughs> uh, with all due respect, fam, your accent isn't exactly giving me Beverly Hills vibe. Uh, so, apparently, uh, look, apparently I have Let's been, just keep it funky. I've been living it well, well life from good in these streets. My parents come from money, everything. I'm like, well, they say they do their research. I'm like, oh, okay. If you did your research, then who am I to say that you are welcome? Fascinating. Now, no one's, luckily, no one's, well, sometimes um, I've seen a couple comments on my show that are like, she don't know the struggle, and I'm like, mm, whatever. Like, that's, first of all, that's subjective, but. Well, you know, listen. you know what I've noticed? Um, and now I'm starting to see that this is a thing on YouTube, but it's something that's been always apparent in, in, in life in general. People give a huge misconception when you're intelligent. Like when you speak, you speak intelligently. Like that's why I love Dare After Dark because Thanks. your comedic timing with stuff that's going on is hilarious. It's literally like, and this again, this is not to blow no smoke up your ass, but it's like, if Trevor Noah stepped down. <laughs> no, nah, that's just, that's it. You just motivated me. I'm, I'm doing one on Sunday. I don't want it to be too Corona heavy because I'm so mother motherfucking sick of Corona and COVID and conspiracies, but nah, I'm gonna do another one. Yeah. But no, I, 
I know the point you're making and it's very frustrating to me because people so often associate urban and black with uneducated and then you sound white if you're educated and that bothers me to my core yeah. because what you're doing is presenting a huge injustice to the black community. That's that's literally what you're doing and it, and it infuriates me to my motherfucking core. Cause yeah. it's like, oh wait, I'm sorry, so if it's not educated, you're white? You're literally putting that race of people above another race and I can't, that shit, that shit aggravates me to no oh, end. Oh man, I've, I've had so many conversations with that and just like the box that we are put in and stuff like that. Even in this industry, like when people go like, oh man, it was such a dope black film, man. Like this, this black. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you just, oh, you just hit another, you just, you just hit another one because, because I remember I have the same issue as a woman and a Latina, because it's like, if there's more than four black dudes in the movie, it's a black movie. But there's 70,000 white people and it's not a, it's not a white movie. No. That's an issue. I've never yeah. heard it. I will have never heard this outstanding white comedy will knock you off. No, mijo, mijo, it's the same thing with if there's too many Latinos, it's a, it's a span or um Bridesmaids, it's called Chick Flick. No the fuck it's not. It was a brilliant comedy. Definitely. Just because there's we have this we deal with the same thing as women and it's mm -hmm. especially now that I'm getting into comedy, it's really, really frustrating. Yo, hold up. What time is it? It's 11.20, how much time you got left? Five minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cause I, I did both of my segments. Like we talked about our stuff, you know, I gave Not, you- cause you know I could do this for the next five hours. <laughs> right, right, right. But no, no, cause I actually too, I gotta be on a, uh, another call with actually with uh, Sosa, uh, my brother and hey. my Tish. We're gonna be talking about graphic designers in today's- You know, it's so funny. Sosa's cousin was one of the people that put uh, my name for the Strum Gourmet show. And I met him for that seven minutes. That's dope. You know some other mind blowing shit about them? Did not know this dude brother worked at all depth for like ever. I didn't know that either. Yeah, no one knows that. So I was just on the phone uh, with one of our meetings. And so I was mentioning to them, I was like, well, yo, uh, cause he does, uh, he's a, he does editing and stuff, video editing. So I was like, yo, just um, get with Chris Sosa's brother uh, about the editing, they was like, Chris Sosa brother works here? And I was like, yeah, uh, Bakhti. They was like, That's so funny. Bakhti is Sosa's brother? And it, and it was like, <laughs> so was funny. Part, they look at the face and then they think of his face and they're like, <laughs> related. They really are brothers. So I don't know why no one knows that, but I was like, y'all that's, you know? that's so funny. Yeah, so, oh, uh, but yeah, shout out to Chris Sosa and all of man. Chris Sosa. Oh, yeah, that's the homie. For sure. He actually, Chris Sosa, bring me back my damn Tupperware. That's you don't know. The, you don't know the list of people that owe me Tupperware. That's not gonna happen. He's from Texas. That shit is gone. Or it's, it's, been used. <laughs> that's it. I try and be a good person. I love giving people food. But then and then just run out of Tupperware. Listen, you just you got look, you gotta find a way to make your Tupperware costs go back, go get paid so you can go oh. buy your Tupperware. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. It's all good. You just gotta upgrade your Tupperware costs in when you feed people. Be like, yeah. hey, just slide me the five. That's the Tupperware replacement. Cause you ain't bringing it back. I need, I need like a Tupperware sponsor. I'm working. I said it out loud. It's gonna happen. Oh yeah, you're doing a food channel. Of course you're gonna get a Tupperware sponsor. That's what I need. A Tupperware sponsor. I'm literally a 60 year old Spanish woman. Stressing about my Tupperware. <laughs> yeah, ain't nothing wrong with that. But Dariani, I thank you so much for being on this show. This is actually my first episode that I'm going to put out. Yep, you are the first. This is your first episode? My first episode, the Will Ferrell Show. I'm stepping out here and I'm doing my stuff. Okay, okay, well, really quick. You didn't tell me this is the first episode. This is, I'm very flattered and great job. And sorry, I get really excited. <laughs> but oh, I'm so Thanks. excited. I didn't even, because we said the whole part, I was like, I feel bad. I've never seen that episode. That's because this is the first episode. The first episode. I finally, the quarantine got me to just go ahead, do my thing, put it out there. The people just want to see me. So I'm just like, let's do it. And I got a whole bunch of dope friends. I want to make sure you get a chance to shine as bright as they can. So, thank you for being on here. Thank you for sharing your story with me. Thank you for, well, you already knew your story. But thank you for sharing your story with the rest of my legion. 
everything that's going to see this and stuff. So uh, if you can, let people know where to find you, what you got coming up, what we should be watching, and uh, a good word of encouragement for everybody out there. Uh, well, first of all, please follow me on all platforms at Dariani Santana. Actually, Twitter, is, it's Dariani, but whatever. Um, and my show, Strong Gourmet, as we said before, just got picked up. So once I can interact with humans again, make sure to watch that on Fuse. And a word of encouragement, bruh, there's nobody like you. And that is amazing. Yes. That's a beautiful thing. So unapolo unapologetically, be yourself, love yourself and love this amazing life that we are privileged to get to live. Facts, all facts are like the young kids say, no cap. Not, so, not a cap in sight. Not a cap in sight. My head too big to wear caps. So that's it would, I should be wearing one because it covers my big forehead, but guess what? You let that big forehead shine. You stop undermining that big forehead. <laughs> smart. I'm, man, I'm fighting for the big foreheads. I'm like, yo, let them out. We tired of small ones. That means you ain't got nothing to talk about. <laughs> but thank you so much for being on here. Thank you for everybody that's checking out the show. Make sure that y'all uh, subscribe to the channel. Follow me as well, Will Farrell. This is also going to be on the regular podcast audio, which is going to be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, um, and whatever that site offers for other podcasts for people to go listen to. I don't know what y'all listen to the podcast on, but it'll be here. So... Um, until then, y'all enjoy the rest of y'all evening, morning, or afternoon. Stay great, enjoy your dreams, and be the greatest you can possibly be because you deserve it. Woohoo! Bye.